Welcome to Chula Vista Presbyterian Church, where today we welcome to the pulpit, pulpit once again, Eliseo, Eliseo Morales. Uh, I refer you to the announcements in the back of your bulletin. The first one about the children's music workshop. The time for the concert will be at 3.30 not three o'clock, so if you make that change. Also, there's an announcement about PW and how they're meeting with the Presbyterian women of the Presbytery this month. Also, there's an insert in your bulletin. If you would please, if you are a female, <laughs> please fill that out and leave it in the heart-shaped disc, the dish, in the narthex as you leave the today. This month, the Presbytery of San Diego met to dissolve the Linda Vista Presbyterian Church. Money was not the problem. They were down to 25 active members, five to 10 of whom came to worship. The preschool and rentals provided them with enough money to fill the pulpit on Sundays with a retired pastor. No, the problem was that the church needs volunteers, and there were just not enough of them. So it is my pleasure to also initiate today as Volunteer Recognition Sunday. And as I call out these particular positions, please stand if you've ever filled them. And if you don't feel like standing, at least raise your hand and keep it, keep it up. And once you stand, please remain standing. Will the active members of the session please stand, if you are able? If not, just raise your hand. Please remain standing or waiting. If you've ever been a ruling elder, please stand. If you are a member of the choir or whoever sung in the choir, please stand. If you are or have ever been a deacon, if you are part of the quilt ministry, if you've ever served on the finance committee, if you've been a money counter or a check signer, and if that applies to you and you did, you're already standing, wave, wave some more. On the SWAM committee, on the HR committee, on FAC and PROP, on the Mission Committee, on the Fellowship Committee, on the Communication Membership Committee, on the Nominating Committee, on Gifts and Memorials. If you've ever served on a committee of the church, if you've ever ushered or greeted, if you've been a shelter volunteer, there's been a lot of those, <laughs> if you are a circle leader, if you are or ever have been a PW officer, if you've ever been a Sunday school teacher, if you've served on the preschool board, if you've ever been an office angel, if you've been on PUM or a New Day volunteer, if you've been a landscape gardener volunteer, if you've been a men's group leader, if you've been a corporation officer of CBPC. Finally, if you've ever prayed for the church, please stand. Look around and give yourselves a round of applause. You see, it takes all of us to get the job done. And now let us prepare our hearts for worship.
call to worship. Who are we, O oh God, that you draw near when we call? Who are we, O oh God, that you crown us with honor? Who are we, O oh God, to deserve your faith and trust? Come, let us worship that God who claims us and calls us his own. And let us begin by singing hymn number 488, The God of Abram Praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, hear the good news and believe. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia, amen.
for the ushers, please come forward.
The Old Testament reading this morning is from Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. This can be found on page 50 in your pew Bible. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, the Lord called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the book of Hosea, chapter 1, verses 10. Hear now for the word of the Lord. Yet the number of the people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can be neither measured nor numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. This is the word of the Lord. I love this little hymn. It's very simple. I sing it to myself almost every day because it's not very complicated. And <clears throat> it simply asks us to listen. Listen to the one who began creation. Listen even if we don't understand. Sometimes we make the fault that we believe God is crystal clear in God's calling for our lives. What God wants out of our lives when in reality sometimes God's roadmap is confusing and has twists and turns, and sometimes uh, we don't always get it right. But if we listen, God is faithful to speak. All we need to do is to listen, even if we don't understand. <clears throat> well, good morning once again. Thank you for allowing me to be here, because I know this is by invitation. I did not force my way in here. Uh, but I am so happy to be here. I love the church. I love God's church. I love the Presbyterian church. I love small churches. I prefer small churches. Uh, you get to know everybody. I love hymns, and I love being here. And uh, today is May 1st. Welcome to May 1st. I know the year sometimes feels like it's going by really fast. So 
sometimes slow, but it is May 1st. And in the first service, I shared that by this point in the year, most people have given up on whatever New Year's resolution they set for themselves. Most common, it's, what do you all believe is the most common one? Exactly. I don't even have to diet, lose weight, get in shape, no matter what age, no matter what gender, everyone wants to be in shape. Uh, and statistically speaking, by mid-February, 83% of people have given up on whatever resolution they had. Whether it was to be fit, uh, change their habits and their finances, whatever it is, they've given up on them. And there's a lot that goes into that, right? Maybe we were uh, not too dedicated to it. It takes 21 days to break a habit. It takes 28 days to form a new habit. So if your one of your goals was to go out and run every morning or go for a long walk, it would take you 21 days to get up on time and begin that habit. And by the 28th day, you will finally begin to say, okay, this isn't that bad. And then it takes a full 41 days for you to finally say, this is part of my life now. Running in the morning, walking in the morning, it's just part of who I am. But most of us don't get to that 41 day mark, right? Because it takes time to change our habits. It takes time, time to develop ourselves. And because of life, we don't always have the luxury of that time. Sometimes we get distracted by family issues, personal issues, or something as trivial as our favorite TV show, or radio station, whatever it may be. We get distracted. But, if we were to take the time to really form that habit, we would see a change in our lives. And as you all know, I work at the recruiting station, the Marine Recruiting Station down in San Diego. And we, got, we get young men and women uh, who have no idea what it means to just focus on a single task. Because they have school and friends and sports, and when that's not a distraction, they have their phones, right? Before the distraction, you had to come home and sit down and turn the TV on. But now, if you want to get distracted, you reach into your pocket, you pull out your phone, and whatever world you want to escape to, there it is. So these young men and women don't know what it means to focus on a single task. The first time in their life they have to do that, and we see that, that in 13 weeks, they change for the better, right? Not everybody makes it though. Uh, but for the better. So we know that if we take the time and the effort to make a change, it's possible. But we're distracted. This morning, I want to urge you to not be distracted. Because I know that we come here on Sundays and we sit here and our, our desire, our goal is to commune with God as a community of faith but sometimes we bring in those outside distractions in here. Now I'm not saying to forget about them or to just dismiss the value of whatever it may be. But what I am encouraging you to do is to focus on this time. On the times that you gather together as a people of God to hear what God is speaking to you. Listen, even if you don't understand God is indeed speaking. Otherwise, if we come distracted and full of other things in our hearts and our minds, we will continue to come and not see any changes. And then who gets blamed for that? We blame God. We say, God's not real. God's not attentive. God isn't doing what God is supposed to do, when in reality, God is always doing what God said He would do. It is us who come with too much mind, too much going on, to really be focused and make those changes. So I'll end this little preface, 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 uh, with this. There's a story where Martha and Mary uh, invite Jesus into their home. And Martha, I, I made this mistake in the first one, I said Mary, but it's Martha who's distracted. She's tidying up the house, getting things ready. She's being a good host. 
She's doing what a good host would normally do. But she has Christ in her home. Christ is teaching, Christ is speaking, and Mary is at the feet of Jesus, and Martha gets frustrated, and she says, Lord, tell her to help me. Tell her to do something. But Jesus lovingly responds, Martha, Martha, you are concerned, other versions say, you are distracted by too many things. Sit and listen. So brothers and sisters, as I begin, I want, you, I want to encourage you to again, leave those distractions outside and let us commune, not, with, not just with each other, but with also with our God. Amen? Our passage today, uh, we find Moses in the desert and after he has left Egypt. Scripture tells us that Moses left Egypt because he killed an Egyptian who was beating a Hebrew slave. The Pharaoh found out that Moses had done such a thing, so out of fear, Moses leaves Egypt and he finds himself in Midian. We don't know exactly how long it was be uh, between the time he left Egypt to the time that Jesus or that Moses encounters Jesus in the desert. Scripture just tells us that it was a long time. Uh, but we do know one thing we don't know how long. He was away from Egypt to when Jesus found him. But what we can be sure of is that every single day, the relationship and the gap between Moses and God was widening. You see, Moses, as, as some of you may or may not recall, is a Hebrew. And he was a refugee as well in Egypt. Pharaoh had decreed that all young males be killed because the Hebrew numbers were getting too big. So Moses' parents put him in the Nile. Moses went down the Nile. The Pharaoh's daughter found Moses. Moses' sister told the daughter of Pharaoh that she would find somebody to take care of Moses. Turns out it was Moses' mother. So Moses was still raised by his mother up until he was a toddler. Um, but then Moses, Moses' mother, had to give him back to the Egyptians. So for those few years of his life, Moses was raised as a Hebrew. He knew he was a Hebrew, but then he was raised as an Egyptian. And everything that came with that, he, ra he was raised to worship and understand the Egyptian gods and how they worshipped those gods. And then, when he ran to Midian, he also took on that culture and those gods of Midian. Can you begin to understand maybe that there's a little bit of an identity crisis in Moses? I am a Hebrew, raised by a Hebrew, saw my people being enslaved and beaten, raised in an Egyptian household, murdered an Egyptian because I am a Hebrew, but then the Egyptians don't want me because of what I did. So now he's in Midian with all of that going on. There's a lot going on in this identity of Moses. It's a crisis of identity. But when Moses encounters God, God first tells him a few things, right? He says, take off your sandals for this ground is holy. But the way in which God introduces himself to Moses is very peculiar. He says, I am the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. In that very instance, God reminded Moses of his identity as his child. A child of the covenant. A child of God. Yes, Moses may have been struggling with his Hebrew identity and his Egyptian upbringing and now his settlement in Midian, but at the core of who Moses was and is, is that he is a child of the covenant made between God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even though Moses may not have known this or remembered this, and even though Moses was physically, spiritually separated from God's promise, God still claimed him as his own and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
Can you imagine what that must have felt like for Moses? Finally having an identity. You and I may be in that same boat. Yes, we are who we are. We're Americans, we're devoted, we're parents, we're siblings, we're all of these things. But at the core of who we are, and the reason why we come to this worship service, why we gather together, it's because we are children of the living God. God claims us as His own. But sometimes we forget. Like Moses, he didn't choose to be put in the Nile. He didn't choose to be raised by an Egyptian. Life had a way of separating him from his identity. And sometimes life has a way of separating us from our identity as children of God. Maybe we've just heard it for so long and so many times. If you grew in a church, if you grew up in a church, you probably heard it on a weekly basis. You're a child of God. Especially if you grew up in Sunday school. Or maybe your parents told you on a daily basis, you are a child of God. To the point where maybe that lost its value and its valor. I am a child of God. You are a child of God. Or maybe life has just beaten us so much and we had so much discouragement that we forget that we are a child of God. I am a child of God. You are a child of God. Life has a way of doing that. Life has a way of distracting us from that truth that we are indeed children of God. And for my, for my message this morning, I want to remind you that you are a child of God, a son and daughter of the Most High, because as we take communion, this sacrament where we believe that we commune with God and with each other, we must remember that we are children of God, claimed by God, loved by God, redeemed by God through the blood of Jesus Christ. When God presents himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Mo, uh, uh, Isaac and Jacob, he is connecting himself, or at least reminding Moses of the bond that he has with him. It's the same thing for us this morning. God is claiming us. God is calling us to remember that we are his children. Family in Christ, God is at all times bringing us together as children of God. God brings us, or for, for the people of Israel back then, when, when, they, when they heard that God was bringing them together, it was to the promised land, gathering them, bringing them. But for us today, it's not so much about going to the promised land because we know and believe that we can commune with God wherever we may be. But it is a reminder that when we come together, we live out that prophecy that Hosea said. We are children of the living God. God calls us. God claims us. I'll end with this. God's title is always Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's, all, that, that, that's how God presents himself. That's how God is always fleshed out. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But what's interesting to me is that God chooses Jacob as part of his title. If you all remember the story of Jacob, he, he wasn't a saint. His name literally means the deceiver. Jacob deceived his brother from his birthright, and then Jacob deceived his father into giving him his brother's birthright or blessing. And then as you read his story, he still deceives people. And then he wrestles with God instead of just obeying God when the angel of the Lord told him to let him go. And then after that, his name is changed to Israel. That's why they're called the Israelites. The people of God are the Israelites, not the Jacobites or something like that. The Israelites. God changes his name. Yet somehow, God's title is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The authors of the Holy Scriptures could have changed it to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel to kind of brush away Jacob's mistakes and issues. But 
God claims himself and introduces himself as the God of Jacob, an imperfect man. I like to believe that it's because God takes ownership of us, of our imperfections, of our mistakes, of our past, no matter how dark or turbulent it may have been. God says, I am still your God. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to always know the right answer or the way, but I am your God. You are my child. You are my son. You are my daughter. Live with that truth. Remind yourself of that beautiful, beautiful covenant that God has made to you because of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we are indeed children of God, loved by God. May we remember this truth now and always. Amen. Let us now stand and repeat the Apostles' Creed as printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Family in Christ. This is the Lord's table. You have come from east and west, north and south, to sit at this table. All are welcome. The invitation has been sent. It is not our right to withhold invitation. God invites, and we accept all those who, has, who have answered his call. Let us pray for each other, and then end the prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Mighty God, this morning we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you because at all times you are claiming us as your own. No matter how far away we try to move away from you, no matter how far away life takes us from you, you call us your own. This morning I want to put my brothers and sisters in this room in your hands. You know what they're going through. You know whatever issues they may have, whatever struggles they may have of mind, body, and spirit, and I put that in your hands. Trusting that you are faithful to hear our prayers and you are faithful to heal us physically, emotionally, and spiritually. I put their family in your hands. Be with them and guide them. I put this community of faith in your hands knowing that they are making big transitions ever nearing to whatever it is you have planned for them, guide them and be with them. Be with the city of Chula Vista for all of its issues, for all of its glories. We thank you for it. Help this church be a beacon of light into this city. And help us to always live out this faith that you have called us into. And together we pray the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you have not received a communion set, uh, please raise your hand. And we'll do our effort to give you one, and I can get one from the back. I know we need one right here. I'll give you one. I'll give you mine. It's okay. I have this one over here. 
At the night of his arrest, Jesus gave thanks. And after giving thanks, he broke the bread, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, whenever we take of this bread and drink of this cup, we are proclaiming the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And then at your own pleasure. Let us pray. Mighty one of Bethlehem, we rejoice this morning in worship. We give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, who binds us to each other and you. Bless the time of bread and cup and remind us of your hope, peace, joy, and love for us. May we who have received this sacrament live in the unity of your Holy Spirit, that we may show your gifts to all the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We will now sing the closing hymn, number 339, Be Thou My Vision. Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.